Mr. McCoy back with part 14 of the ear, the eye, and the arm. The cattle went about the business of feeding while a few goats milled among them. A pair of young billies butted each other with their horns, but most of the animals were perfectly orderly and boring, Tendai decided. He was given a switch to drive the animals from vegetable gardens should they be tempted. They never were. The meadow was full of foxtail and whisk and couch and other kinds of grass uh, Tendai didn't recognize. Up the sides of the valley grew thick strands of thatching grass. It was woody and not attractive to the cattle. Tendai knew it would be harvested to mend the roofs of the huts. Boy sat on rocks. They chewed tender new stems of foxtail almost as placidly as the animals below. Mopani flies hovered around their eyes. They brushed them away. The shadows under the trees shrank as the sun moved toward noon. What must it be like to sit here month after month, thought Tendai. You listened to the monotonous chewing of the cattle, the tepid rustle of water as it fingered its way through the reeds. You brushed away thousands of Mopani flies through the years. No wonder you brooded a lot about the personalities of your cattle. A cow bawled from the middle of the stream. That's clay belly, said Benga. She always wants the grass on the other side, and she always gets stuck in the mud. Tendai welcomed the diversion. He followed Banga into the water. Stay on the rocks. The bottom is sticky around here. Tendai got behind Claybelly and pushed her rump, while Banga hauled on her horns. Claybelly complained, but eventually worked herself loose. She lolloped up the bank, spraying mud and water on all sides. Everyone laughed. Then it was back to the rocks, on chewing to chewing on grass stems, listening to the sluck of water and brushing away Mopani flies. Tendai had a lot of sympathy for Claybelly. She at least had the imagination to try for something beyond her reach. The sun crawled to noon and passed. Let's play a game, suggested Hatsa. Tendai brightened. The boys went to a flat hollow in a stone. The hollow formed a tiny arena. Each boy produced a fat peanut that had been marked with charcoal to show the owner. Two boys would set their peanuts twirling like little tops in the arena. The object was to knock your opponent's piece out of the hollow. Tendai didn't do well at the game. Time after time, his peanut was sent flying to the delight of others. After a while, the game became as deadly as sitting on the rocks. No one except Tendai noticed. Finally, when he was ready to scream with impatience, a girl showed up with lunch. The boys fell upon roasted mealies and boiled pumpkins. They drank a Swedish slightly alcoholic drink called Mahiu, made of satsa and water left to ferment from the night before. Tendai, as usual, had a separate bowl and a calabash full of mayhew. The food disappeared very quickly and still the boys were hungry. To quiet their stomach pangs, they set about coaxing termites from nests. They poked grass stems down holes, the soldier termites fastened onto these, and were pulled up and eaten. Banga produced a leather sling. They all collected smooth pebbles from the stream and took turns slinging them at targets. Tendai did very well at this. On the plants growing out of the water, a colony of weaver birds had built their nests. These were cleverly constructed baskets attached to the tips of reeds. They swayed in the breeze as the bright yellow birds zipped in and out with food for their young. Banga suddenly hurled a rock and struck a weaver bird just as it perched on its nest. The bird dropped straight into the stream. Everyone cheered as Banga waded out to claim his prize. He proudly displayed the little heap of blood-stained yellow feathers. Tendai thought about the baby birds waiting inside the nest for food that would never come. I'm a fool, he thought. This is a traditional village. These people can't go to a restaurant for lunch. They have to hunt. But he couldn't help feeling sorry. The boys killed several guila birds, uh, which was all right. They flocked by the hundreds in the reeds and were a serious pest. Banga built a fire and roasted the tiny creatures on a spit. What is your opinion? Is it okay to kill birds if there are a lot of them and they are pests? Share what you think. Here comes the Kamba clan, said Hatsa just as they finished picking the bones. They don't graze this meadow until tomorrow, Banga said, but he didn't seem surprised. 
Along the ridge at the top of the meadow came a gang of strange boys and another herd of cattle. The boys halted, but the animals kept on coming. Shouldn't we stop them? Tendai said. Not yet. Anga's eyes shone with excitement. The others of Gariaki's clan were suddenly wide awake. Won't the cattle get mixed up? Vanga looked at Tendai as though he were crazy. How could they? You don't get your brother mixed up when he's playing with other children. But to Tendai, all the animals looked the same except for Claybelly, who was covered with mud. Kambas began constructing something on a small hill. Tendai couldn't see what it was until they stepped back to reveal two mounds of dirt the size of small anthills. Things were getting stranger by the minute. Uh, you be our bull, said Vanga, pushing Tendai to the front. He's a visitor, objected Hatsa. Grandfather says he's going to be one of us, so he has to prove himself. Vanga yelled a perfectly filthy insult at the combos, and they answered back in the same way. A big, mean-looking boy shouldered his way to the front of the rival gang. He had a horribly scarred face. He made hand signals Tendai didn't understand. Ooh, said the Gariaki clan. You aren't going to let him get away with that. I didn't know what to do. He didn't understand the situation. What's wrong with his face? He whispered to Hatsa. He fell into a cook fire when he was a baby, Hatsa answered. Tendai was horrified in the city. Such an injury could have been corrected. What's his name? Why are you asking all these questions? He's the Kamba's bull. That's all you need to know. However, we call him Headbuster. Great, thought Tendai. He watched with a sinking heart as the mean-looking boy swaggered up and down in front of the mounds of dirt. Boys on both sides hurled insults. Suddenly, Headbuster spun around and kicked one of the mounds to smithereens. Ooh! cried the Gariaki clan. Get him! Get him now! yelled Banga. I don't understand, Tendai said. You idiot! He just insulted your mother! Then Tendai understood. It was a ritual fight. One gang against another him against Headbuster. He hated fighting unless it had a purpose. He would have fought to the death to protect Mother if she were really there, but this was a stupid game. Banga and Hatsa and the others yelled themselves hoarse, trying to goad him into battle. No one needed to push Headbuster. He looked as if he wrestled hyenas for sport. This isn't fair, Tendai murmured. Fair? Fair, you're our bull, you coward. Go get him, shouted Banga. Finally, reluctantly, Tendai sprang into action. He ran up the hills, circling around to get the advantage of the slope between him and his opponent. The other boys scattered. Headbuster swayed back and forth with his arms out like the pinchers of a scorpion. Tendai let him get close. Headbuster lunged, head down, and Tendai stepped aside and threw him down the slope. The crowd went wild. Headbuster roared and charged up the hill again. Tendai threw him back. Every time the bigger boy tried to butt him, Tendai used his momentum to throw him off balance. Finally, he rolled the big boy all the way down the hill to bang against a rock. Blood poured from Headbuster's face. He howled with rage and pain. And that seemed to be it. The fight was automatically stopped. Kambas helped their bulls stagger off along the ridge. They rounded up their cattle and drove them away. The Gariaki clan danced around Tendai. So what do you think is going to happen now that Tendai is this big hero? Share with your fellow listener. I thought you were afraid, said Banga. That was a good trick, brother. You really caught them off guard. You're the best bull we ever had, the others cried. Tendai laughed along with everyone else, but inside, he felt dishonest. The fight hadn't been fair, not for reasons the Gariaki clan could imagine. All those years of practicing with the martial arts instructor had paid off. And for an instant, when the ugly scarred boy lay at the bottom of the hill, Tendai had been right down there with him. He knew what it was to be overcome with terror. He felt the dull, ox-like panic as blood dripped down his face. Then the instant was gone as he was surrounded by the ecstatic Mariaki clan. The martial arts instructor said that that was what made a bad warrior, Tendai thought, as he was carried in triumph around the meadow. I didn't do too badly, though. It felt good when Banga called me brother. At the end of the day, the boys herded the cattle and goats into a kraal surrounded by thorn bushes. Tendai understood that the fight was to be kept secret. The elders forbade such goings-on, while at the same time expecting them. 
was one of those confusing village rules. If Tendai had run away from the fight, everyone from the smallest child to Gariaki would have been ashamed of him. The old man wasn't supposed to know, but from the smile he gave Tendai at the dare, it was clear he had been informed about the victory. Tendai was completely happy that night as he took his place in the dare. Everyone included him in the conversation. This time there were no riddles, but much light-hearted banter about bulls. It was only when Rita entered with his dinner that Tendai became uneasy. She looked so tired, her face was pinched as though she hadn't been eating enough. There were even little burns on her arms. Uh, what on earth was going on? Rita stumbled with weariness as she left Badair. Tendai knew then he would have to confront Gariaki before leaving Rusthaven. Rita was suffering, and he didn't even know what was happening to Kuda. He took a deep breath, a few deep breaths, to get his courage up. And an ancient woman he had not seen before hobbled into the men's meeting place. She whispered something to Gariaki. Immediately, the atmosphere of the dare changed. The boys were sent out while their elders stayed to confirm. Tendai branched off from the others to hunt for Rita. He found her cleaning pots with sand and ashes. Want me to help you? He whispered. She moved aside and he took over the work. A cry sounded in the distance. Something's happening, he said. Poor Chipo, she's having her baby, said Rita. Tendai worked silently. Childbirth was something he didn't like to discuss. It's too early. She was supposed to travel to her own family at the end of the valley. Women do that with their first child. Now she can't. Mayanda sent people scurrying all directions to find midwives. More than one? Gariaki insists on at least three. Another cry sounded in the night. And I shivered. How are you? You have burns on your arms. Oh, that, Rita said dully. I ran afoul of one of the rules in this charming place. I ate one of the mealies meant for your lunch. I wouldn't have minded. Even the she-elephant didn't care if I ate something extra. She always gave us enough. Rita was crying silently, hopelessly. Mayanda said I was stealing. I don't steal. I was hungry. I didn't know how to ask. I'll save you my food, promised Tendai. Why hadn't he thought of that before? The women heated peanuts on the coals. They held me down and put them on my arms. Tendai was so shocked he couldn't speak. He found Rita's hand and held it tightly. I suppose it will scar. A doctor might be able to fix it if we ever see a doctor again. Of course we will, Tendai said. Oh, Rita, I'm so sorry. I'll make it up to you. They sat together, holding hands in the dark. The moon rose over the wall of Resthaven, painting the quiet muscles trees with silver and trailing a bright shimmer on the stream at the valley's heart. Dinner with the Masikas. We've come up in the world, said I, admiring his new dashiki in the mirror over the sink. Hurry up, here complained. You've been standing there for 15 minutes. The dirty dishes had for once been washed and put away. The mirror had been polished, but nothing could be done about the crack. When I looked in it, half his face appeared to be lower than the other half. Arm lounged in an easy chair. He wiggled his freshly polished shoes to catch the light. Mrs. Masika insisted on taking the dashikas before, uh, because they were a gift to the general. He never takes gifts, she said. People might think they were bribes. He always gives things away. Ha! You don't believe anyone gave the general a skinny six-and-a-half-foot dashiki, Pierce said, watching Arm uncurl from the chair. No more than they gave him earmuffs. Pierce smiled into the mirror over I's shoulder and patted the new muffs. They exactly matched his dashiki. I wonder how she knew we didn't have suitable clothes. Arm looked around at the sagging furniture and peeling paint. It must have been a lucky guess. The doorbell rang. Arm peered through the peephole and saw General Masika's chauffeur glancing around anxiously. Shortly afterward, they were sailing off over the cow's guts on their way to the Mile High McElwain. The detective sat in the back so they wouldn't make the chauffeur nervous. As they approached, they could see tier upon tier of lights festooning the Mile High McElwain. Everything a human could want was there, from the grand lobby on the ground floor to the elegant starlight room one mile up. It was the kind of place the detectives could only afford in dreams. 
At the moment, the starlight room was obscured by a small cloud. You have time to visit the lobby. I have time to pick up the general and his wife at the university, the chauffeur told them. So here, I and Arm walked through the magnificent entranceway and tried not to look like tourists. The lobby was built over a lake. Guests could watch bream or tigerfish for dinner if they liked. Giant glass walls separated a wilderness area from the walkways, which had glass floors over the water. The sun was near setting, and day animals were changing places with those of the night. Lily Trotter stepped delicately from lotus pad to lotus pad. Kingfishers darted among the reeds. Flocks of quailas flew in formation. They turned, dipped, and landed in a twittering bunch. Under the glass floor, a crocodile gazed up at them with slitted, calculating eyes. So what does this place make you think of? Share with your fellow listeners. And now, seconds more of the ear, the eye, and the arm. I grasp arm. I can't help it. I used to watch them on the river where my mother washed clothes. So did we all, said arm, steering him past the spot. The crocodile rose gently until its eyes poked out of the water. It floated along under them, keeping pace with their feet. At last, it sank down again. To wait for another tourist, I said. To wait for another tourist, Beer said with a shudder. We'll have to wait for part 15, but it's coming. As the ear, the eye, and the arm continues. <laughs>